Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll just let everyone just settle and take their seats. Um, can I just say one of the speakers in this session I haven't managed to meet, um, Julian? Ah, there, okay, great, <laughs> perfect. I just wanted to check that you were here. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, I, I, think we should, I think we should get started. Um, so this session is barley breeding and new breeding techniques, um, MBTs, and then a way forward with a question mark. So I'm guessing this session is all about new technologies. Um, and so, of course, the area that I work in, and um, what I, because I'm a little biased, but I think one of the most exciting new technologies that we have at the moment is genome editing. And we're fortunate that our keynote speaker, Jochen Kuhlman, is going to be able to tell us about the uh, genome editing. So I think without further ado, if I can hand over to you, Jochen. Yeah, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Full of adrenaline and caffeine. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure for me to be here and I would like to thank the organizers for putting this exciting program together. And thanks uh, for making me a part of it. It's about genome engineering, site-directed genome modification in Bali, and I will uh, talk about methods and applications. So the major tool of uh, site-directed genome modification is um, are the CRISPR-associated endonucleases, and um, they are taken from uh, uh, microbial immune systems actually only two components of these systems. And uh, the major component, of course, is uh, the Cas endonuclease itself, shown in blue here, and uh, a guide RNA, which um, has a specific part, a customizable part, which um, directs the Cas endonuclease uh, to the target we want, uh, um, we want this endonuclease to act. Um, as a second part, this guide RNA has a scaffold, and the scaffold has a, um, a certain two-dimensional structure, and um, by means of this two-dimensional structure, uh, this guide RNA interacts with the Cas endonuclease, forming a, ribonucle uh, a ribonucleoprotein complex. And this complex is now capable of uh, scanning uh, DNA, the DNA of actually any host, and it was a bit of a surprise that even in higher organisms this works pretty well. Um, so Cas endonuclease has also some uh, helicase function. Uh, it is able to unwind the double-stranded DNA and to screen it first for a, um, for a very small motif. Uh, it is a pro so-called protospacer adjacent motif. Uh, which is actually, in the case of Cas9, a double G preceded by any nucleotide. And, um, and there uh, it stops, and then at the opposite uh, strand, the guide RNA checks whether there is compatibility, and if so, this Cas9 nuclease accommodates and activates two domains, uh, which then cuts the two, doubles, uh, the two strands of the DNA. And this is actually all what the, what the tool is doing, the rest is done by the cell itself um, because um, it is capable of fixing broken DNA. Of course, no organism could survive without this capability. And, um, and this, uh, repair, these repair mechanisms are uh, somehow error prone. So if this Cas endonuclease cuts again and again the same position, um, um, a certain proportion of, uh, of um, repair events will result in small deletions or insertions um, or substitutions. And then again, um, the experimentator has the opportunity uh, to do further manipulations to uh, render this process more precise than just uh, random uh, repair events in the right location. So, um, to be powerful um, with our platform, we have developed a vector system. 
and for some of you it might be complicated, but uh, there's no chance to skip that. Uh, and you will maybe also learn about uh, the components which are involved in the process. So I will go step by step through. The first element again is uh, the guide RNA. These guide RNAs are actually non-coding RNAs and therefore they are driven by other promoters than messenger RNAs. And these, um, these uh, transcripts are processed by polymerase 3, not by polymerase 2 as uh, is the case for messenger RNAs. And so uh, here you see a POL3 process promoter, which are typically U promoters coding for uh, such small RNAs. And, um, and then the Stark uh, block is a scaffold which interacts with the CAS endonuclease. And in between these, the small specified part is inserted by Golden Gate cloning, which is a kind of seamless cloning procedure. So you can really exactly integrate these some 20 nucleotides which are specific for the target and uh, in our system um, we thought okay uh, in some cases um, it makes a lot of sense to simultaneously express a couple of guide rnas and so we designed the system uh, for uh, four different guide rnas uh, at least for the time being this of course can still be extended and a couple of these pol3 promoters are available um, for these elements and um, once these guide RNAs uh, have been created they are assembled in, a, uh, in this kind of structure you see below. The second um, component is a CAS endonuclease. This is driven by a standard uh, promoter, typically a ubiquitin promoter, a strong constitutive promoter and terminated and, and in our system we thought uh, it is um, nice to have versatility and uh, we can exchange any of these components readily and therefore um, we have uh, this other assembly here for this CAS endonuclease uh, expression unit. And uh, promoters can be easily exchanged and also terminators. And um, this is then uh, um, assembled and as a third component we thought okay let's have a, a flexible component where we can integrate any a functional element, be it an embryogenesis booster, be it a repair template or whatsoever, what may be the requirement for the future. And we call this auxiliary unit. So, and all those three components are then um, assembled in, um, in uh, a vector we can use for direct DNA transfer and in a last step, um, this functional part can also be transferred to a binary backbone so that we can also use agrobacterium transformation. So um, the first example shall just demonstrate the power of the method. Uh, we thought um, two rod barley is defined by the, the function of the VRS1 gene and it was known when you knock it out um, um, this two road barley should be converted to six road barley, which is a tremendous change in morphology and of course also of yield potential. And so um, we looked for a suitable target motif in this gene, created um, the vectors, transformed barley, and this for simplicity shows you just this one example where we deleted just one base pair in the sequence, knocked it out there by through um, interruption of the translational reading frame. And uh, the result was uh, truly six road barley. Looks pretty easy, it was amongst our very first examples, so we were quite excited to get it. Um, the second example uh, goes more into the nutritional value of barley. It is about naked barley. Um, it is characterized by adherent, Mali is actually characterized by adherent hulls, so probably everyone knows um, that uh, it is not really comfortable to eat these grains directly, at least not the common form, uh, but there is also a so-called hullless form in which um, these hulls are not sticking to the pericarp and, um, and this is uh, um, quite common in Asia, used as food, but not so much in Europe. And um, although uh, barley is, is um, um, pretty healthy, uh, mainly because of, of the high content of beta-glucans. 
So, and um, it was shown already in, in, uh, in 2008 that there is just one um, major switch, uh, acetylene response factor gene, when it is knocked out, the whole machinery for um, uh, to produce this glue between pericarp and the hulls is switched off. And this is uh, just the difference between naked barley and uh, common barley. So um, we looked at the gene, looked uh, this time for a couple of target motifs and uh, produced quite a lot of uh, mutants. And in all mutants, which um, entailed a knockout of the gene, we had the same phenomenon. At the left side, you see the hulled grain, and at the right side, you see the naked grain of the mutant. And again, there were examples where just one nucleotide was deleted, um, which caused this um, very obvious phenotype. Uh, the upper picture is just one, one side of the grain, and the, the lower is the other side of the grain. And of course, um, here I also take the time to convince you that these are heritable traits. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see the, the wild type. And um, in the center, you see different families uh, of, um, of grains produced by these mutants. And uh, you see after mechanical threshing, these grains are almost all naked. And the few which still carry a hull um, there the hull can be easily removed by hand, which is not at all the case in the wild type barley. And uh, very interesting, uh, a scientist should always keep um, the eyes open. Um, in this case, we also did a, um, an off-target analysis uh, because this was a transcription factor with some related genes. And just by good luck, we stumbled, uh, stumbled across a, a, relat a related gene which turned out to be the known WIN1 gene, and uh, this um, was a spin-off of, of a separate story. So we um, um, were capable of um, elucidating a whole uh, spot of genes, which all regulated by this uh, by this gene. And you see the difference between these two uh, barley um, spikes. The right one, um, there, the, the VEX layer at the leaf sheath is entirely missing, and this is this, this one gene. So next story is about uh, resistance, um, namely virus resistance. So in, um, before lunch, there was a session um, describing the whole um, concept of virus resistance. And these are actually the same genes. So uh, we, we talk about susceptibility genes. Viruses are very small particles, not really organisms. And they, they generally require to, to recruit genes from their hosts. And these susceptibility factors are essential for, um, for their um, spread and um, for inducing the disease. And um, there is one gene, which is a eukaryotic uh, a translation initiation factor, EIF, um, EIF4E. And um, together with, or under the guidance of Niels Stein, um, let me calculate. 17 years back, this was our first cooperation, Niels, when we uh, when we um, identified this gene as a as a as a resistance gene for bimovirus resistance, and so we knew this gene quite well and thought, okay, uh, let's try to mutate it in a way to genocopy these resistance alleles which are still functional. So we looked for in-frame mutations. We were not very successful in that. We just got knockouts in this case. But nonetheless, to our surprise, even the knockout plants um, were viable and um, were obviously not very different from the wild type, and they were fully uh, virus resistant. However, um, um, in the end, we found there is a, there's quite a um, yield penalty in these lines. And so we took a second approach, which is a bit more precise than to uh, get mutations um, while the function of the gene should be retained. And this, this approach um, was uh, conducted by so-called base editing. I will come in a minute to this principle. Here um, it is shown um, where 
where the mutations reside of the known resistance alleles. There are two resistance alleles of this gene called RIM4 and RIM5. And it's not just one SNP in one allele. It is uh, uh, three in the case of RIM5 and uh, four in the case of RIM4. And uh, of course, it's complicated to mutate all of them. So we started se separately, thereby also intending to elucidating which of these SNPs are really causal for, um, for um, entailing this uh, resistance. And uh, we created guide RNAs and used um, um, this um, um, base editing approach. And the idea behind was uh, to try to precisely genocopy the known resistance alleles, but also to uh, produce new alleles, which, uh, which may be a resource for breeding for future approaches as soon as the current resistance alleles are overcome by the virus which is, of course, an, illusion, uh, an evolutionary process we know very well from many resistances. So uh, here we see uh, this, um, these genome editors. It is actually a Cas endonuclease, which is disarmed, which doesn't cut the DNA, but it is hooked to a um, cytidine uh, deaminase or an adenosine deaminase domain, and uh, these domains just exchange one nucleotide into another one. And thereby, the translational reading frame is retained and the gene has a good chance uh, to keep its function, even though it is mutation, mutated in one side. And um, we first uh, tried that in protoplasts and, and found that uh, these contracts are working. I do not show this. Uh, here you see uh, a bit busy slide um, the example of uh, the RIM41 region. Uh, in the first line, you see uh, the wild type um, and uh, the Cs, which can be converted by the cytidine deaminase into Gs, are in green. And in the second uh, line, you see uh, the resultant amino acids, which are encoded by this wild type. And the, the RIM41 allele, which can fierce resistance, has one SNP, which is indicated in red. And this uh, SNP um, causes the change of a serine into, into a phenylalanine. And um, this is um, for us a marker for the resistance. And we tried to reproduce that and were successful. So now the third double line um, uh, represents our edited line, which is exactly the same allele as the one which is known. But in addition to this, we produced new alleles which are also hopefully functional, and, uh, but with other SNPs and other amino acids in the vicinity of this crucial region in the gene. So, and all this is very new data, so we have only the primary transgenics of these plants. Um, in, some, in, in total, we have two new alleles, and all this material now needs to be tested, first for heritability of the mutation, second for their effect on resistance. So we have still work to do and uh, of course we are happy about it and looking forward for new results. The next story is um, that um, we have a second column next to genetic engineering in, in our group which is a biotechnology which is very important for breeders. This is haploid technology and here just uh, a few introductory slides to take along everyone except those who are already sleeping. Um, so we have different um, principles uh, of the formation of haploid plants. The most common one is to use uh, immature pollen, which is haploid, uh, namely the microspores, which is a direct product of meiosis. They can be cultured and reprogrammed to follow cell proliferation, embryo-like structure formation and plant regeneration. And according to the haploid origin, the whole plants uh, are haploid or they undergo a whole genome duplication and are then immediately genetically fixed across a whole genome. The second method, which is not so common, is called parsinogenesis, where, um, where it's the turn of the female part. Uh, any constituent cell of the embryo sac, all these cells are haploid, can uh, induce in some systems also to cell proliferation and regeneration to give rise to a haploid plant out of the uh, caryopsis. And a certain method, which is um, uh, more important for what I will be telling you in a moment, is um, 
so-called uniparental genome modification, a complicated term. It means um, we need a haploidy inducing line which is used um, to cross your line which you want to um, render haploid. And, uh, but what all of these um, systems have in common is that you start with a haploid cell, it undergoes cell proliferation, embryogenesis, plant regeneration, and then it can be clonally reproduced because it's entirely homozygous. And of course, to be reproducible, it needs to, um, um, to um, undergo whole genome duplication to be again diploid. So just as an example, which illustrates well how this uh, haploid technology works, it's not just rendering a plant homozygous, these haploid cells are product of meiosis, so they are all recombinants. And just as an example, we crossed here um, white barley and, and, um, and black um, barley grains, um, and these F1 plants were then used to produce double haploids, and as you can see in these 10 examples shown, out of uh, almost 400 we had, uh, that um, all these plants produce different grains, but one plant produces just one sort of grain. And this is ex actually what the breeder needs. The breeder just selects what, what he or she wants and um, then can go, go on in the process. So, and what we did was um, then to use um, those, those haploidy inducers uh, in crossings. And the basic principle is uh, or mostly used as a, as a, as a male parent. So um, we, get a, we get a hybrid zygote and, um, and during early embryogenesis the, the parental genome is eliminated because these two genomes do not really correspond in the development. And um, so a haploid embryo um, develops and the double haploids are then produced by whole genome duplication, be it spontaneous duplication or colchicine induced um, um, genome duplication. And uh, the examples are um, given um, historically already, so you may have heard about the bulbosum technique when you when you pollinate barley with its wild relative hordium bulbosum, um, a certain portion of the offspring is um, um, indeed haploid. And the same holds true when you, when you pollinate wheat by maize. And also in potato, there is such an example when potato is crossed by a certain wild species. But there are also intraspecific crosses with certain mutants. And in maize, meanwhile, um, it was shown that uh, these haploidy inducers are dependent on certain mutations. And, um, and another principle was found in Arabidopsis, where the central um, histone 3 was modified. And there are a couple of related uh, examples which are not shown here. And what we did was to, to take this phospholipase A gene, which was shown to be the major factor in these haploidy inducers in maize, which have been used for, for uh, decades, and try to mutate it in barley and try to develop barley haploidy inducer lines. So here we see this uh, PLA1 orthologue of barley we uh, selected two target motifs, and below you see the mutations we obtained. First line is a wild type. The cutting side is indicated by the scissors, and then you see four selected um, uh, mutants for which we obtained homozygosity for these mutations. So it looks like that, that uh, uh, we pollinate barley with this uh, PLA1 mutant, uh, and uh, 17 days after pollination, we collect the grains because also endosperm development is um, typically hampered. So we need to do embryo rescue for that, but this works quite well. And um, so as a proof, we pollinated three different barley cultivars um, with these mutants. Uh, first, Golden Promise, which is our workhorse for transformation, and then also the reference um, Barley, Sparke, and Morex. And here you see the result uh, when we pollinated Golden Promise by selfing or cross pollinating the other two, we got quite nice um, proportions of haploid plants. So the, the principle worked. And uh, of course, double haploids can be produced pretty easily in barley, but I had actually another story in mind. And this is again coming back to cast endonuclease technology where. Um, we use such haploidy inducers uh, as, a, as a kind of 
transfer mechanism of the CAS endonuclease. And what we do is to transform these haploidy inducers by the constructs expressing guide RNA and CAS endonuclease and use that as, as pollinator. And um, the mother plant is the one who uh, shall be mutated. And um, after pollination, we got the hybrid zygote. And in this moment, the, um, the CAS endonuclease and guide RNA find their target in the maternal genome. Um, the transgene carrying genome of the male parent is kicked out by this technology, as I showed you before. So, and leaving alone this uh, haploid embryo, which is mutated, can be doubled and uh, can be um, converted into a mutant, which is free of tDNA in, um, in any, um, in any um, genotype you want to mutate. So, I hurry a bit up. So there were uh, actually two different um, concerns I had in advance. The first was, is it possible to express um, this uh, guide RNA and cas endonuclease in sperm? Sperm cells are pretty small and specific. And uh, here we exemplified it in maize. What you see is uh, a maize pollen grain, which just um, bursted in a monitor solution uh, releasing the cytoplasm, including the two sperm cells, which is indicated here on the pic. But if you look uh, the same object with a, a fluorescence microscope with a GFP filter, you see that these two sperm cells really express nicely the GFP. The second concern was that the sperm cell is very, very small. This, um, this picture shows you an, an example of uh, a technique I um, performed many years ago, 25 or so, or so back. And uh, this is in vitro fertilization, but it demonstrates very well how big is the egg cell and how small is the central cell when these were aligned in this electric field. And just as a side story, this in vitro fertilization also worked out, which is shown in the two next pictures. So uh, the question was, does it work? And we have already the answer, not in barley, but uh, we have done that previously in the combination of uh, wheat-maize crosses. So we transformed maize uh, by these cas endonuclease constructs, pollinated wheat, and we got, um, in five different genotypes we tested, we got mutations. We used common wheat and durum wheat. Um, we uh, got mutations in all three subgenomes of wheat, and we had two target genes and three target motifs. So it's a little success story. It was nicely published, and with that, I would like to conclude my talk, um, but I would not like to forget to thank all the people who did this work. So uh, from left to right, Stefan Hieke um, worked a lot on the concept of this cascade uh, vector system. Um, Christian Hertig, the second one, um, worked uh, hard on this naked barley story. Iris Hoffi was the one who in the end created this cascade vector system. Uh, Pooja, uh, the Indian lady, um, worked on uh, the PLA1 story, uh, Robert on uh, the, the virus resistance, and Dia is a lab supervisor of uh, Pooja, who also contributed a lot. So I would like to thank all these people of the group, of course, not to forget also the, the real heads of the group, which are the technicians doing all these different transformation techniques. And um, so this is um, Ingrid, Sabine, Heike, and Carola. And of course, finally, I want to like, I want to, like to thank the cooperators, Sofia Gerasimer from Novosibirsk, um, people from uh, Julius Kühn Institute in Quedlinburg, and uh, Thomas Heubach and Andreas Müller from Strube Research, which co who cooperated in this um, haploidy-inducing uh, method. And of course, the major funders were the federal ministries of uh, education and research, and so on for food and agriculture. I thank you for your interest. Thanks. Question to your first example. Of course, I'm very curious. Uh, how did the six row yield in comparison to the two row? This is ongoing experiments. Um, it is not uh, a tripled yield so so far. So good. <laughs> Great talk, Jochen. Thank you. How, how is it going with RNP? I mean, what's uh, the, uh, I mean, the percentage of delivery if you compare it to the agro and delivery? 
So you mean uh, uh, direct de de delivery of the agents. Uh, I actually did not talk about it, but of course uh, the RNPs are also formed um, in Planta. Um, so it, uh, it can be pretty efficient So um, at the cell level. So we only worked um, in, in protoplast systems using these uh, molecules and it can be as efficient as, uh, as um, PEG, for instance. Yeah, so this will be good to validation of any SGRNA you want to use. I assume that's why you do it in protoplast. Yeah. But how yeah. how efficient is it going to the whole to the whole plant later on? So we, we initially tried uh, to code gold particles, uh, particles, and uh, we asked repeatedly Kaisha Gao how she does it, but she didn't really tell us. And uh, so this is uh, amongst those stories I would like to hide because they were not successful. I can't help ask how many of you have done a lot of these plants uh, with uh, NAI and, and so how many has been tested in the field? Um, this is a very good question and of course very problematic to be done. So what we have done so far is to use uh, field-like conditions. So we have uh, small greenhouses which are safety level one and in Europe uh, all these little modifications are um, considered as GMO. And, um, and of course, this is not real field conditions, um, and this is what we can do at the moment. But of course, there are again activities to revive um, these, um, these true field trials, uh, but uh, this is more a political decision than any, any decision of ours. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, also, thank you to, to the organizer for, for inviting me to present here my work. Also, I want to thank all the all my colleagues that were involved in this work, and they will some of them will be presenting in, in the coming day. So, short introduction. As you know, Valleys cultivate at different altitudes and latitudes around the world. Uh, as we have heard in the previous topic. Global warming is increasing the climate stability, especially in the developing world. So, be the the different range of the environment need to set the adaptation pattern of the breeding line as soon as possible. This is the case of the ICARDA Breeding Global Value Program, which is started in different regions with different objectives. For that preliminary trial, I a key step. One traditional approach is to evaluate all the line in only one location and then go for multi trial in the second stage in yield trials. This approach has the problem that mm, uh, this location may not represent very well the, the, target, the all the target population environment. So the, the ideal scenario will be to do multi environmental trial already at preliminary yield trial, but this strategy has its problem, mainly due to the cost, also, the, also due to the seed availability. For that, we propose the genetic assisted sparse testing this strategy allows multi-environmental trial evaluation at preliminary trial just a function of the cost of other MET strategy. We will call it as, as that henceforth. And uh, here we compare three, di three different multi-environmental trial strategies. These are two replicate per location, one MET design per location, and genomic assisted expert testing with 90C markers. In the right part, we have uh, we have the graph where we represent the cost. US dollar per number of line per total number of line evaluated in an environment in which in one environment in one environment with four locations. The red dot are marking the total number of lines that we evaluate. In our case they are one thousand lines. The different lines are representing the different MMT strategies, the green white the expert testing, the orange one is the multi evaluation per per environment, and the blue one is two replicates per environment. As you can see, the expert testing green one is around two twenty thousand dollars. The orange one, the aumenting design, is almost the double, and the two replicates per location is more than, more than three times the cost of the sparse testing. But what is exactly this strategy? It refers to the use multi environmental trial in which none of the genotype are planted in all location. So the design is based in the proportion of overlapping, overlapping genotype and the, or in, um, sorry, and the non-overlapping genotypes. In the right path, we represented a multi environmental trial with four locations and 1,006 unique lines. This is actually our real case scenario. The red line are representing the lines that are overlapping between environments, and the green line are representing the line that just planted in one location. So the idea is having this sparse testing and using genomic prediction model 
that account for the GBI interaction, we can predict all the all the all the genotype not planting one in all location. The benefit of this strategy are it enables our MT already uh, early generation. It's allowed data recovery from field trials, reduce reduce well load per location, and increasing the selection intensity at fixed cost. Our plant team is composed of 1,000 line FCs, the unique lines plus CIS check. They derive from 534 crosses coming from the combination of different 92 patterns coming from different origins. The proportion of two row is 26% of the line, and the six row is 74% of the line. Our population was genotyped with 96 market distributed along the genome. You can see in the plus chromosome, they were selected from a 50 kg chip used in the genotype on the crossing block. Those markers were selected for being unlinked, also for being situated beyond the spectral recombination in the chromosome. Also, the amount of frequency was higher than 0 0.4. And we tried to include some QTL uh, that we found in the crossing block. Before use, using this, this marker in our population, we did an one analysis to see the subset, to see the, resp the represent representative of the subset. For that, we did the correlation between the two key matrices, the one coming from the 50 kids near chip and the one coming from our market data set of 96 cast marker. So we did moment the version cast marker already. As you can see, the correlation was high, was 0 0.78, just with the offline um, values. When we change our, uh, to our population, we change the technology, we change to the cusp technology, but you can see in the, ball, in the down box plot, the market characteristic is seen in the crossing board we maintain in our population. Our MNT was played in four locations. Each of them has three, three, 340 plots per location with 316 unique lines. The proportion overlapping and no overlapping was 80C overlapping and 230 no overlapping. And the genotype were located based on the pedigree matrix. With that, we ensure a, a equally genetic distribution of the parental lines. Once we got the market information from the trials, we checked this distribution. For that, we did a principal component analysis with the CAS marker. We colored the entries according to the location and the red dot, the sorry, the black dot are representing the lines that are overlapping between locations. So as you can see, all the locations seem to be well represented, to, um, genetically well represented. In the right part, we see the four environment and the entries color in four in four categories. Uh, in four colors, sorry, and this is because we have four categories for the entries. The first one, the blue one, are the genotypes that are planted across the location. The purple, the yellow one, sorry, I didn't, I didn't see it. I don't know if I said the first. The blue one is repeated across location. The yellow one is repeated with the location. The purple one, the purple one are actually the check, and they are repeated with the location, across location, and the green one are the replicating one. So at the end, we have 27% of the line overlapping. Those are, these are the, the, the repeated across location, are also the check, leaving the 73% for the repeated with the location and the replicating one. So for analysis, we selected four environments, a representation of four different target population environments. The South Timor range, henceforth, we will call it a location one. The North African Highland location two. The West Asian Highland location three. And the area environment, the area environment that will be location four. In the right part, we have the genetic correlation between the environment. And in the bottom part, we have the yield trial heritability. They range between 0 0.48 and 0 0.6. For the data analysis, we set up a 10 fold cross validation with, with 10 to 5 iteration. We started with the VAR model, and after that, we were adding different co variables such as road type and population strata. We ended up adding the hybrid matrix. The hybrid matrix was, was made by adding the pedigree information to the kinship matrix. Later on, we will see how that is done. And finally, we calculate the, the genomic prediction accuracy doing the correlation between the plus values and the genetic estimated building values. So the fair analysis, we've, we fit a multi-environmental trial model, which connects all the environment and allow, allows the chain of information between environments. So now we are able to obtain a genetic value for, il, for each line, also the genotype by environment effect. But in this case, we have to remember that we are in spare testing, so not all the genotypes are planted in all locations, and it actually the assisted genetic, which enables all the, the prediction of the combination by genotype by environment. In the right part, we have the results from the bare model. 
As you can see, there are differences between environment. Location one and three got better results than location two and four. And the mean prediction accuracy value was 0 0.26. In the bottom part, we have the result after the addition of a road target population status covariable. But the, the addition of this, of this covariable didn't improve the prediction accuracy because this information was already captured in the kinship matrix. Here we present the result after the addition of the pedigree matrix. This pedigree matrix was made by giving to the pe this yeah this hybrid matrix sorry was made by giving to the pedigree matrix any way between zero and one, and after that we added this information this information into the kinship matrix. In our case, we just use um, values from 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 by increment of 0 0.1. That's what we see in the plus legend. And those results are, are represented by the lines. The red dot in the graph are representing the results that we got in the bare model. And as you can see, the prediction accuracy improved in all the locations instead in location three. And to present the result, we select a zero, um, a prediction accuracy, sorry, a pedigree weight of 0 0.6. The result, this weight, sorry, is improving the prediction accuracy in those locations which the bare model got low, lower result. Those are location two and location four. But in location three, the, the prediction accuracy is, in, is decreasing. The mean prediction accuracy in this case aumented slightly compared to the bare model from 0 0.26 to 0 0.28. But what is really important for breeders is to, to advance the best line to the next state for that. It's capital to accurate uh, identify the top scoring lines for a given trait. So here we look at the top 30, top 30 lines in two cases scenario. Firstly, in the cross validation, and secondly, so you see, yeah, firstly in the cross validation when we compare the genomic prediction value with the blue values, and secondly to the comparing the two, the top 30 in a stage two with the top 30 in a stage one. The stage two was carried out one, one year later. Firstly, uh, looking at the cross validation, we see how in location three, the 50% of the line were, were identified by the genomic prediction. We see that there are differences between environment, but in this case, there are less differences compared to the, to the prediction accuracies. In the right part, when we compare the tops, we did three different comparisons for, for each location. We compare the top 13 stage two with the top 13 stage one. Those are the, these are the green bars. Also, we compare the top 30 in stage two with the top 30 of genetic value in stage one. These are the yellow bar. And finally, we combine those, these two tops and we call this combine and those are the, the blue bars. As you can see, the, the best result was where got with the combination of the two tops, keeping location two and three more than, keeping the 55% of the top yielding line from stage two to stage, from stage one to stage two, sorry. And you can see location four is missing because at that time we didn't have the results. In location one, we were this in Morocco and we were expecting lower results because there we had the, the worst drought in, in 40 years. So as conclusion, genomic assisted pest testing provides accurate multi-environment that are a fractional cost of other strategies. The hybrid matter gives more accurate results than KC or pedigree along with nitrogen markers. The MIT genetic model allows to identify the top yielding genotype reliable across year with relatively high accuracy. The next step for this work will be increase the number of markers, use associated phenological traits with higher correlation to contribute to yield prediction, incorporate environmental covalent to the model, and use, and use data from genetic related data as part of the training. This is actually the, the stage two. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I want to thank all the co all the collaborators in, in this work. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for testing this, first of all, because I was very curious about this myself for some time. I never had the capacity or the resources to try this. Very interesting. I wonder, did you, I, maybe I didn't see it, I didn't understand it. Did you uh, compare what you would have gotten from the single locations? compared to your final conclusion. So you started your conclusion. Maybe what you select from one location is you not... Mean if we did the core validation with the location. Yeah, I mean, if you say, okay, if I would have tested only in one location, does this correspond yeah. to, or what's the difference? Yeah, how, you know, how, how do you compare? Yeah, yeah, we are talking about Mediterranean area. So 
in this case, in the cardiac breathing program, we are seeing that the correlation between environment is not more than 0.3. Normally, it's lower. So when we compare this result, the location one within stage two, the multi-environmental trial, we see that we don't have a high correlation between them. Yeah, yeah, we, we tested the, the, the location one. Kevin has sure. A so um, maybe I missed it, but how did you select the lines that are replicated across all of the locations? Yeah, they are selected based in the in the pedigree matrix. Yeah, randomly. Yeah, you you we just assure that all the parental lines were were representing in every group. In F six lines, how long did it take to produce those F six lines? <laughs> Okay, this information already got it from the breeding program, but the program is actually doing speed breeding, so I think four years, five years. Okay, thank you very much, and um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to sort of talk to you and share a little bit of our recent work, genome editing in Bali. So um, what I'd like to do is to probably just touch on three things. Um, all of which you know we've looked at with a view to just trying to improve the efficiency of genome editing overall in one way or another um you'll notice that um i put tom lawrenson's name on here basically because a lot of the work that i'm going to talk to you about was carried out by tom lawrenson in my lab and unfortunately he wasn't able to come to the meeting um but hopefully i can do some of his work justice okay so i don't need to do any introduction, which is fantastic, because um, Jochen's already covered the CRISPR-Cas system. And of course, all the genome editing that we're doing uses CRISPR-Cas because it's such a beautiful and simple system, only needing those two major components. So the, the Cas, usually Cas9 nuclease, that's our molecular scissors for making the double strand break in the DNA, and the guide RNA, the guidance system to actually guide those, that nuclease to exactly the location. And then it's what happens at that as Jochen's explained at that cut site, that's really important. Now, we didn't talk very well about what we were going to cover. So you will see that my first example will look very familiar, but I just want to use it to make one very brief point. So here it is. You've seen this before. <laughs> and you know, we love, we, this is just beautiful because it's such a beautiful, um, easy to see phenotype. So it's the VRS mutation. We've also used this as a sort of a, a way of actually using it as a beautiful marker to see how efficient the editing is. Um, but what I was, so I don't need to say anything about it, but um, I don't know if this works. Oh yeah, there's even a little video, so you can see the sixth row turning around here. But the only point that I want to make on this is that when we looked at the primary plants that we got back following this editing experiment, I'm not sure you can see it in these pictures, but we can see a number of things. So we certainly found plants that were completely sixth row. So that told us that the edit had happened very early on, and we had homozygous or biallelic edits. Um, we, found, we saw some plants that clearly had the editing components present, but they were still two row. And then we had other plants, which were a mixture of sixth row and two row. So this just tells you that there the editing happened later, um, and some of the cells are edited, some are not. So some of those spikes are edited and some are not. In fact, I've even seen individual spikes that are half two row and half six row. So this just shows you that um, anything can happen really when you're doing this sort of editing experiment. Um, but obviously what we're interested in particularly are those very early edits that give you the phenotype right at the beginning. Now, um, that's an example of a, a simple targeted mutation because the CRISPR-Cas system can do many other things. Um, you've always heard a little bit about base editing, for example. Um, we've done a bit of work in the lab on gene targeting. I'm not going to talk about that today. There is a paper that you can look at if you're interested. It's something we're very keen to improve the efficiency of so that we can make precise insertions at a targeted locus, which may be important, for example, for if we want to stack disease resistance genes later on. But what I want to talk about today is um, firstly nuclease variants. So how can we make improvements by using different variants of Cas9 or an alternative to Cas9? And then I want to just touch on multiple 
gene knockouts and what we can do to improve the efficiency there. But before that, um, probably one of the most important things is that we've got to get the editing components into the plant in the first place. So um, we do this using agrobacteria mediated transformation. So everything goes on in on a tDNA. So this is the barley transformation system. It's about 25% efficient. Um, of course, if we could, now, you would have heard a lot about Golden Promise. This system is in Golden Promise. This is our standard. It transforms beautifully. And there's a few other genotypes that we can transform, but generally, transformation is very genotype dependent. So if we could overcome genotype dependence, then that would take us a long way towards um, being able to edit directly in the genotype that we wanted. And we've already heard possible methods touched on. So just forgive me a moment for um, switching to wheat, just for a couple of slides, because the wheat transformation system in, is very similar in many ways. It's based on agrobacterium inoculation of immature embryos, the same as the barley system. The efficiency was sort of, we had quite a good system. The su efficiency was quite similar, about 25%. But um, in 2020, um, some work was published um, from the University of California, Davies, and they um, started using uh, developmental regulator genes in the wheat transformation system. So this followed on from previous work using the baby boom Wuschel system, these sort of morphogenic regulators that were having a big impact in maize and also um, in other, other cereals. But in this paper, um, this is a, um, a GRF, so it's a growth regulating factor, um, combined with an interacting factor to make a chimeric protein. And if this is expressed during the, at the right stage in the wheat transformation process, you get a really big boost in transformation efficiency. So we were lucky enough to work with the group and to try this out in our wheat system. And what we found was that, yes, it did have a... In our fielder is our sort of golden promise equivalent in wheat. It's the model genotype. It boosted transformation efficiency. It was pretty high in these experiments anyway, from 33 to 77%. When we tried it in Kronos, in the tetraploid, the effect was even more spectacular. It went from 8% up to 70%. So this was work carried out by Shadia Hayter in my lab. And Shadia has now gone on and she has looked at this in a whole... In fact, I think she told me 10 different genotypes now. They all transform. Um, range of efficiencies, but they're all transformable, and some of them, many of them actually are very high. So you can see some of them here, Paragon, Cadenza, important for some of our genetic resources. Um, Skyfall is a, a, a very, it's one of the top UK um, varieties at the moment. So the important thing about this in wheat, it allows us to pretty much do the editing indirectly, the genotype that we want. So the obvious question is, can we do something similar in barley? Wouldn't it be great if this worked in barley as well? So we had a look, um, and this is quite preliminary, but um, so of course the first thing we tried, if you just look at the very first um, panel here, where there is, we're looking here at, um, we're looking here at editing efficiency, or um, think of it as transformation efficiency. Um, yeah, this, so the first one, basically there is nothing there. So the initial thought was, well, this works beautifully in wheat, let's just try the same constructs in barley, it should work but unfortunately not, it didn't work. We didn't get anything back. Um, and what we actually saw was plates that were full of beautiful looking callus, loads of callus, but it wouldn't regenerate. So this was not gonna work um, under a strong, I should say that the GRF, GIF protein is under a strong maize ubiquitin promoter. That was just too much in barley. Now the, the second um, bar that you can see where compared to the control. I will say that the efficiencies are quite low in these experiments for various reasons. The control is only, I don't know, between 15 and 20%. But you'll see in the second part, we've got a big increase in efficiency. So how, do, how was that done? So that was um, the result of a, a very a recent publication that came out showing that another gene, this is a wheat, WOX5, was found to overcome genotype dependence in wheat. So we thought it would be worth trying this in barley as well. And we did get you know, a, a big increase in efficiency. So this was initially looking very promising. Another approach that we tried was to put the GRF, GIF, under a different promoter. So to put it under a promoter that is only expressed at that crucial time when the um, tissue is beginning to um, regenerate. So the early, it's basically we want it active in the scutellum. 
Um, and a promoter that is quite good for doing that is um, PLTP promoter. So it's a maize phospholipid transferase protein promoter. Um, and it had previously been used to express these type of morphogenic regulated genes in maize. And it's active, we know it's active in the scutellum. So that worked a bit better because then with that promoter, we were actually able to get um, a reasonable efficiency uh, using um, the G original GRF. So, but the important thing is, okay, what did the plants look like? So here are the plants. So you can immediately see that the um, Wax 5, that plant doesn't look great. Um, now I have to say something, these are actually, I think, setting some seed now. So it's not all lost, but it does look, it's a little barley bush really, which isn't ideal. Um, whereas the PLPT, the PLTP GRF um, is looking pretty normal compared to the control. So I said, this is, this is pretty early days. So the answer is, can we do, and we are now looking at some different genotypes in barley to see what happens. So I think this is a, the answer to the question, okay, can we do something similar? We certainly can't do anything like we can do in wheat at the moment, but maybe it's looking a little bit hopeful that we can use this sort of system to overcome genotype dependence in barley. Okay, now back to um, editing. So editing in barley um, is pretty efficient. So this is showing 15 target genes, the average efficiency is 44%, so it's quite, it's quite high. But you will see that the efficiency is very, very variable. So, um, you know, from a very, very low efficiency up to almost 100%. So we could really do with it being more predictable and boosting up those low ones to a higher level. So one thing that's, um, that's come up in the literature recently is the idea of using intron-mediated enhancement, especially in the nucleases, to boost, boost um, expression. And this is something I dug out a really old slide from many, many years ago, when we actually used this technique to boost transgene expression. Um, and when you add um, an intron into a, in this case, it was a luciferase reporter gene, we got a very big boost uh, in expression. So this has also been used in Cas9. So the very first report was a single intron included in this um, Cas9. It was a, a plant code on optimized task Cas9 that led, was reported to lead to high efficiencies in Arabidopsis and tobacco. Um, following on from that, there was a second example. Rather than just using a single intron, in this case, 13 introns included into the uh, Cas9 coding sequence. So, um, and you can see, I've just highlighted the, the number of plants with, the, if you look at the bottom three in this figure, these are the ones with the introns. So these are the ones that are giving the really high, um, high incidence of the knockout phenotype. So we wanted to try this in barley. So what we did, we took our original Cas9, which is actually the, the human optimized one. We took the version with a single intron and we took the one with 13 introns and we put them into barley. Um, so we used two target genes. And basically, the editing was pretty efficient in both of these anyway with our standard method. Um, the single intron, it was still good, but not didn't really do that much. But when we used the one with the 13 introns, both of these targets, actually, the editing went up to 100%. So it was an indication that this was looking very promising. So, so that's one tool that we can use. Um, what about an alternative to Cas9s? So we've also looked a bit at Cas12a. So Cas12a has a, a number of um, different features to Cas9 that sometimes can be useful. So for example, obviously the PAM requirements are different. It's based on Ts. It's particularly useful in AT-rich regions, maybe like promoters or possibly introns. It tends to give larger deletions, which is sometimes a benefit. Um, it also possesses its own um, ability to process the pre-RNAs, um, so to, you know, to actually process um, our arrays, guide arrays into single guides. So, um, yeah, so we, we tried um, Cas12a in barley with a number of different target genes. It's showing three here. I'm going to go through this really quickly. Initially, it didn't work. This was the original Cas12a or CPF1. 
but we realized that actually this barley we were culturing it at too low a temperature it wasn't going to work we only saw editing in the next generation when we actually grew the seedlings at a high temperature and then we were able to pick up some edits of course since then we now have uh, versions of cast 12a that are temperature tolerant so we've overcome this problem so looking at the um these other these uh, new versions of cas 12a so here we're just looking at exactly the same guide array in all of these constructs either with the original he, um, human cas 12a there's a rice optimized cas 12a and then there are two temperature versions with the temperature tolerant mutation so tom in the lab made a, a version of the human one with the temperature tolerant mutation and there's also the arabidopsis optim codon optimized one so if we look at the efficiencies that we got from these, it's sort of surprising. Our original one was quite good. Adding the temperature tolerant mutation has boosted that up quite a lot from 30 to 54%. And for some reason, the other two didn't work at all. So we then, what Tom then did is he took the, the last one, so the, um, the temperature tolerant um, Arabidopsis codon optimized version, exactly the same construct and he thought okay what would happen if I did a similar thing to what was done with Cas9 and I added introns so that's exactly what he did and he added eight introns into Cas12a and basically what that did is it boosted the efficiency of this nuclease from nothing up to 83 percent so it made a massive difference so this is you know this is um this is one that we're actually now using quite extensively, and it's it, not only in barley, but in other, it works beautifully in brassica species as well, for example. So that at the moment is our most efficient uh, version of Cas12a, and the, the results are just summarized there. Okay. Um, so this is just a comparison. I just put this together for target genes that um, we'd previously edited using Cas9, using the old method. Uh, m then we'd used um, Cas12a. And the thing that stood out is that actually the Cas12a is giving high levels and a lot more consistent editing, those more consistent high levels compared to the variation that we were seeing with Cas9. We probably need to look at a lot more data, but I just thought that was interesting. So just one other thing that I want to touch on, and this is... Um, this is a sort of multiplex editing, and it's the impact, initially, the impact of um, the guide architecture that you use when you're trying to do multiplex editing. So when you're wanting to edit, say, up to four in independent genes at the same time. So these constructs actually just contain four guides again, the same four guides, but there are two different architectures. So, and these are using the temperature-tolerant um, Cas12a. So the first one is using the Cas12a processing. So, but the second one has got individual cassettes, each with their own promoter and terminator. So each guide has its own promoter and terminator. Okay, and you also see the ribozymes here for um, helping. That's uh, been published to show that that is a, a good thing to include as well. So basically, sorry, the figure at the bottom is a little bit confusing, but basically um, what we're looking at here, if we say that... Um, a is our is the first architecture and B is the second one. If we just look at the first example, which is a VRS gene again, with that first architecture, we've got very high editing like from guide one, a little bit from guide two, nothing from three and four. Whereas if we went to the second architecture, where each guide is in a separate cassette, then we then have got editing at from all of the guides. So one has gone down a lot, but the others have all come up. And it varies a little bit, but you can see similar patterns from the other targets that I've included there as well. So this is, you know, if you're wanting to do multiplex editing, this is um, probably a, a good approach. Um, so just one more thing. Um, as we were looking at these improved nucleases, so the improved Cas9 with the introns and the improved Cas12a with the introns, um, we were beginning to need to do more multiplex editing. And Tom thought, well, what would happen if we use them both together? Because for some target genes, actually, because of the target site, um, it's better to use Cas9, and for some it's better to use 12a. Um, so could we put them both together, and then what would happen? And so that's exactly what he did. Um, so what I'm showing here 
I just so system one is the original system. Um, so these are double knockouts, and it's just showing the percentage of plants that are of edited percentage of plants that are edited at both target genes. So this is the first two bars in the red. System two is where what we've done is just used Cas9 and Cas12a. Um, with a mixture of guides depending on which one was the most suitable. So we actually had four guides for each target gene. So in the system two, we've got two double knockouts, one triple and one quadruple, where we've knocked out four genes. Um, so in the quadruple, there were 16 guides in that construct, so four for each target gene. And you can see that actually in the first generation, we've got a very high level of editing at all targets using this approach of including both nucleases. So I think that's just another tool that we can use to sort of improve efficiency, you know, going forward. So I think that's, that's, I've just about run out of my time. So I just need to thank the people in the lab, really, in particular, Tom Lawrenson, who you can see there, um, Shadi Ofting, the wheat transformation, Alison, who does all of our barley transformation, um, and all the other members of the group. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Wendy. It's really exciting to see all these new technologies. Uh, I have actually a couple of questions. One is, excuse my ignorance, but why do introns uh, have this effect? And the second is, uh, when you have these new systems with increased efficiency, um, what's the effect or in terms of off-targets? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so two good questions. On the introns, um, I think we've probably got other experts in the audience who better tackle that. I mean, I think the, um, the you know, the, the, the role of introns is probably quite complex. Why it's having such a dramatic effect in this, in this context, probably exactly the same as it's been used in the past uh, to enhance transgene expression. I mean, I've yeah, I, I, I'm not the person to go into the details of why it might be working so well, but it certainly does. Um, on the off targets, so we, when we do our designs, we, we're very careful to try to design in such a way that off targets should be very un, unlikely. Um, so we haven't specifically looked for like unexpected off targets. We haven't done that. Um, we haven't seen when we, for example, if we're editing and just, especially in wheat where we're only wanting to hit one copy on one genome, you know, we have shown that we can do that quite successfully. So um, I don't, I can't, I think the, the dual nuclease, it's a little bit early for me to say, it's just possible that it might give you additional problems with off targets, but we, we simply don't know yet. Uh, thank you for a really nice talk. I was just wondering a little bit about single guide RNA optimization. And I see that you've used for single guide RNA per construct? Is that the optimal or have you tested it out or do you have any thoughts on it? Okay, so when we were just doing um, individual knockouts, our standard procedure was to have a pair of guides um, and probably to make two constructs, each with a pair of guides. To, and using that approach, I think we've knocked out everything we've tried to knock out in Bali and it's quite large numbers of genes now that we've knocked out. Um, we now know that we can go up to 16 guides in a construct. Um, so, you know, I don't think we would now be limited. To, we wouldn't limit ourselves to two anymore. If it made sense to add additional ones, we'd certainly would. Um, so four is fine. I think it just depends what you want to do, really. Yeah. Hello here. Uh, one of your slides here in the middle somewhere, you had the green bars showing the variation of deficiency. I think it was spanning from 7.7 .7 to 97%, which is huge. So is there a molecular explanation to this? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think the answer is, again, we don't really know. Um, you know, we do the, when we design, so we are not testing our guides in advance. We're not testing them in a protoplast system or anything like that. We're just doing the design in the best way that we can using the various online tools. And then we're just going for it and trying them out. So, you know, they, they, they can be quite variable. Um, it may be just uh, features of the particular target location, you know, the um, structure of the genome at that point. Um, but yeah, we, if we knew exactly what was going to make the perfect guide, then I think we'd be in a very good position, but we don't. Yeah, thank you. 
So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to be moving away from really interesting uh, technique development that's quite optimistic and uh, delving into politics, particularly European politics. So I'm going to be talking about where we are with uh, new breeding techniques regulation, but the only of those techniques I'm going to be really talking about is, is, uh, is gene editing. So um, I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the red zone here, as you see. I hope that the pointer shows. Let's see. Pointer. And laser pointer. OK. So I'm going to be talking about the red zone in Europe. You, you all who are coming from the green zones, uh, you, you can uh, move your uh, gene edited lines into breeding and then into farmer's hands and ultimately into crops for, for yield, um, nutrient use efficiency, sustainability, more healthful products. But in Europe, uh, we can't do it here yet. We can do very nice work, but we can't do it. So uh, the, root, the root of our problem actually stems back to the original definition of a, a genetically modified organi organism. Uh, so uh, the problem stems back to 2001. And basically, it was that the, um, uh, the definition was that a GMO is some uh, organism that's been modified in a way that does not occur naturally by mating or natural recombination. Interestingly, they ignored natural mutations, somatic mutations, uh, kind of assumed a kind of Aristotelian fixed uh, genotype, which, of course, we all know is not, not true. So, um, <clears throat> So 2001 regulated process, not the product. So the techniques of uh, genetic modification that were listed basically meant that you took some nucleic acid made in any way possible, put it into a vector, moved it into a host organism, and then um, <clears throat> that, that, that resulting organism would be a GMO. So um, they also uh, listed other things such as cell fusion, um, and then uh, mutagenesis. So microinjection was also included. This uh, original law said inter alia, so it meant including other methods, perhaps, among others. But we don't know. Uh, this, was real, this hasn't um, ever been defined as to what they actually meant there. Um, however, um, they said uh, that the directive will not apply to certain GMOs, things that are GMOs, but are not going to be regulated. And among them was mutagenesis. OK, sounds very good. Mutagenesis would not be regulated. So the question then comes for us is, are, um, is, is, are uh, gene-edited uh, organisms uh, under the line of, of mutagenized organisms that aren't regulated? And this was the crux of the question I'm coming to that was looked at in 2018. So uh, firstly, a question one can ask is, is are cases where you make a simple indel by a non-homologous end joining process, is that very different from any other kind of um, mutagenized line? Um, <clears throat> or is base editing or allele replacement actually very different? Uh, or cisgenesis very much different than what can be achieved naturally? So. Um, there was a case uh, brought uh, in 2018 by Confederation Paysan from France, together with some other uh, um, uh, in, uh, organizations. Uh, they brought it to the uh, European Court of Justice. And um, basically, the European Court of Justice ruled that, um, in fact, that the new mutagenesis techniques, in other words, those that came into existence after 2001, in fact, um, allowed the introduction of modifications of, of uh, changes at a rate far out of proportion to the modifications likely to occur randomly, which of course is not how, how, a, how a single targeted mutation could be at a rate higher than multiple um, random mutations is beyond me, but that, it's, not, it's not correct, but that's how they saw it. And then they also said that, well, the new methods, uh, although uh, have to be um, uh, tested have to have a long safety record, but they never define what a long safety record is. So we don't know if it's two years, 20 years, or 200 years. But basically what they says, anything that was done before 2001 is OK, anything after not. 
So, um, <clears throat> so yes, so looking at the ruling, our organis under 2018, our organisms obtained by mutagenesis GMOs, well, that was already clear, 2001. Um, does uh, the exemption to random, uh, to, uh, to random mutagenesis also apply to, um, uh, to uh, GEs? The answer is no, um, but it still applies to random mutagenesis. So um, the, the problem with the ruling that way, the logic is that actually to, uh, to be a, a GMO, lines that are, are mutagenized, to be, they must be GMOs, but um, a mutagenized line does, that they're referring to don't actually fall under the definition, the original definition of, uh, of a GMO. So actually they never really settled the, the situation because uh, the GMO is defined as something that can be altered in a way that does not occur naturally. And we know that uh, GEs can be altered in ways that do occur naturally. So there's a problem there. <clears throat> so now we can take a look at the road forward uh, where, we're, where we've moved since 2018. And um, basically the universal dismay uh, of the entire community, whether it's the scientific community, the breeding, industrial, uh, users, uh, stakeholders in the regulatory sector, and so on, uh, with the with the decision of the Court of Justice, uh, led um, the the uh, European Council uh, in 2019 to request the Commission to go back and look at what how the novel genomic techniques in in light of a 2018 judgment created might be uh, amended or create trouble. So what to do about it. And uh, th uh, I'm happy to say that was brought, put forward, the request to do this was put forward during the Finnish presidency during that year of the council. So, um, so the problem was the council saw that it brought legal clarity in 2018, but it raised all kinds of other th problems. So um, currently the, where, where we are is that there's a, um, a roadmap that was laid out, uh, the European Commission took its time then to form um, this roadmap, and the roadmap was basically set in 2021. It led to what was called an inception impact assessment. So the beginning of the impact assessment, where there was a questionnaire that went out very broadly, a, a, not only restricted to Europe, but others could answer, and they received thousands of replies. A lot of them came through uh, NGOs where, um, the ones that I saw, because you could you could search them. Many cases, the text was exactly identical. They were they were uh, against the uh, legalization, if you will, of of, of GEs, um, where the, the language is exactly the same, but translated to various uh, languages. Um, so uh, the commission got all these, and uh, my understanding is that they're treating them all as they treated them all as if they were sync one reply, not. 2,000 replies with the same text. Also, various other stakeholders, including EPSO, of which I'm president and was involved with this process, uh, answered, hopefully, um, with, with greater impact. So um, that, that happened, that led then, that was considered, and from uh, that process, there was a proper impact assessment being carried out now, uh, actually over the course of this summer, <coughs> ending, ending later this month. That will then be cooked down together and produce sometime in uh, 2023, the beginning of 2023, actual proposal as to how to move forward. So um, the, the main driver for this whole roadmap was a realization that there were legal uncertainties and regulatory impossibilities such, and also uh, some violation, uh, for example, of the uh, international trade agreements whereby two products cannot be treated different differentially if they're identical. So you can imagine if you have a, a conventional mutagenesis uh, uh, derived product and one that done by GE and you have the same change in the DNA, how can you treat the products differently? <clears throat> so that's a violation of uh, WTO standards. But what they're trying to do is to figure out whether and how there should be risk assessment, um, whether there should be sustainability analysis of, 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 of GE uh, products, 
whether they should be traceable or not, what to do if they're not. So they, they're, they've, um, uh, EPSO responded to the roadmap saying that basically that, um, that if you're going to have sustainability criteria, they should refer to, they should actually deal with all techniques and approaches, not just uh, new genomic techniques or GE. So um, if you're going to have sustainability, it has to be not just for one breeding method, but for all breeding methods, and not just for breeding, but for all products. So, uh, so I mean, if you have a hamburger bun on a hamburger, what part of, the, and that roll is done with a GE wheat, what part of that product is sustainable, and how do you measure that? So um, also, risk, risk assessment for NGT should be proportionate and not just um, based on the technique, but actually on the modification that's made. So. Um, likewise, the issue of labeling. So labeling should not become a barrier uh, to products coming to the market. And uh, so you can imagine a situation where GEs will become permitted uh, to be commercialized, but the barriers will be so high th through sustainability criteria and labeling and so on that no one in any case could do it. And I think that's very much in the, the minds of some of the NGOs. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a post-COVID voice uh, in, in, in the minds of some of the NGOs to bring forward. <clears throat> so uh, this uh, past um, uh, autumn, we issued a, uh, uh, a white paper basically talking about these issues of sustainability, risk assessment, labeling, and so on. So, uh, so now if we go over to the UK, which now is outside of the EU, uh, they, they're going forward in, in uh, you know, they're not waiting for the EU to do this stuff. They're going forward on their own. So um, it's OK. DEFRA, DEFRA carried out a, a, a consultation on this. This is the uh, Department of Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs. Uh, and uh, the Royal Society weighed in on this consultation and um, basically asked that innovation should be accessible. There should be uh, impacts on trade should be considered. Uh, impact on organic agriculture is a two-way street. And um, IP is also, in a way, a two-way, a double-edged sword, maybe, to use a different metaphor. And uh, consumer choice uh, needs to be taken into account. Uh, DEFRA responded to the various ways, saying that they're going to make GE field trials easier from this year forward. And uh, no, there will still be a need for notification, and there will be a path to commercialization. Um, there was then, uh, a few months ago, the, uh, the Queen's speech where, with the opening of Parliament, the, uh, uh, the speech took into account these things and indicated that these will, become leg these will be legislated in, in, in the, in the uh, new session. So it's looking, looking promising for the UK. But meanwhile, back at the ranch in the EU, um, the, the consultation is going forward. There's been a questionnaire, as I mentioned, which is being forward. And they're asking questions about such things as, um, is, is the current situation interfering with your activity or sector? They're asking, uh, what is your view on risk assessment? And what criteria should be used to doing the risk assessment? Um, what about cisgenesis and so on? Um, should the potential contribution to sustainability be considered? And what sustainability criteria should be used? And what analytical method? What, so if there are no analytical methods available to detect a GE, what do we do about the question of traceability? Of course, part of the problem with the questionnaire is you have to accept the premises of the questions. So you might not accept that there should be any traceability, for example. Or what do you do in countries that don't have traceable systems because they don't, they don't consider these to be regulated, and then those products come into the market. So in any case, uh, the coexistence question comes up, and who does the labeling, and who pays for the labeling? Is it the organic sector or conventional sector, GE being part of the con conventional sector? However, OK, so that's a general regulatory situation right now and legal situation. But as we've heard just in the last few talks, there are GE products, uh, projects going forward in the EU, very many. And just to mention the, the range that these, these projects are, they cover everything from chicory to wheat. 
Um, in, the, uh, in the UK at the moment, there are some really interesting uh, field trials going on with GE wheat where um, asparagine synth synthetase that's expressed in the seed has been knocked uh, out or greatly reduced in activity so that uh, the idea is to lower free asparagine so that acrylamide formation in biscuits and toast and so on would, would be reduced. So that's, that's undergoing field trials already that were sown this, this past winter and be, will be continuing. So that's very promising. <clears throat> At the same time, there have been other, other approaches. One is to see, well, what the consumers in Europe really think. So in the north of Europe, there have been a number of consumer surveys that have been done, Norway, Sweden, uh, UK, Netherlands, and uh, Finland, we did a stakeholder survey, and there's a public survey, uh, which we are currently in, have applied money to do. So um, just taking the Swedish one as an example, it turns out that the majority of Swedes who were interviewed are positive towards the use of gene genome editing and plant breeding, where the aim is beneficial for the environment and society. And um, in fact, four out of 10 Swedes think it's unethical not to use an existing technology, such as CRISPR-Cas, if it can solve serious uh, problems faced by society. And the same thing is true in Norway. Um, there was a crop booster project uh, survey in, in, in UK and, uh, and the Netherlands, which produced a very similar results in both places, whereby the majority of people support uh, either totally or with some uh, limitations the use of uh, genome editing, and uh, the rest are undecided. So actually the consumers don't see it that it's, uh, it's such, a, uh, such a bad thing. So the NGOs are in a way out of, out of step. So there is another consumer survey uh, in the UK which indicated that people were pretty fine with potential health benefits or uh, increased access, making food more affordable, or tackling uh, the impacts of climate change. Uh, so um, uh, just, uh, just uh, pulling this together then, the question is um, what's ahead for uh, gene editing and new breeding techniques in Europe? Um, is there light at the end of the tunnel? So uh, the proposal for legislation will be uh, issued sometime in the spring 2023. But uh, whether this will help us or not, a lot depends on what they're going to be doing with the sustainability criteria and labeling. Whether sustainability cri criteria will be, who, who, who will decide it, how will they be, how, how will they be um, uh, determined, and how widely will be they applied. So we don't know any of that uh, at the moment. So it's only a proposal. The other thing is that um, things move slowly. It's better it's done now because if it's not done before the next parliamentary elections, it will get delayed onward. And I would like to very much see it done in my time <laughs> before, uh, before I retire, or before any of you retire. So uh, that's where we are at the moment. Um, it's uh, a patience game. And uh, just, uh, I just need to thank uh, Karin Metzloff and uh, Ralph Wilhelm uh, and Jens Sundström for their contributions to putting this together because they did a lot of the collection of the information. Thanks. Quite a question about the surveys, Alan. In any of these surveys that have been done to ask about genome editing, do they first ask the people they're asking the question if they actually know what genome editing is? Yeah, yeah, they do, uh, and, and then there's a process by of explanation. So there's like normally two phases in that. But um, I should mention that a lot of the people I didn't. One thing I didn't mention is that uh, consumers that want to have labeling, they also want to have labeling of all methods that have been used to make their food. So <laughs> I don't know, you know, what do you have to put on a p package made with doubled haploid barley's or something. What, what they would do, what they would know about that. Yeah, I was, I was going to compare it actually to labeling of plastics that uh, is used to wrap food. It's a pretty simple thing to do, but we can't seem to identify what plastics can be recycled and what plastics can't. It's, it's, it's legislation gone mad. You, you touched upon uh, labeling products or, or labeling the methods. So the question is, I think breeders would prefer to have the approval of the method rather than the product, because it'll be a hassle to have all these products go through. Have that been discussed? 
Yes, it's been discussed a lot. The problem, the problem with labeling the method as it is in Europe right now is that, as you see, the, when the method changes, a new method by the, by the precautionary principle is simply excluded. And how do you overcome the precautionary principle? So if you can, so what I would propose, what I've been putting forward is to use the, the, the grass principle. So in North America, at least, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. has a generally regarded as safe principle. So if there's been a food ingredient that has been regarded as safe all along, it can be used. And if something is not substantially different from a product that's regarded as safe, it will be regarded as safe. So, so if you make a change that doesn't make a big I mean, if, it, if, it's, if it's a disease susceptibility gene that you knock out, which doesn't affect the storage proteins or the micronutrients in the food that, 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 that's in the tuber or seed, why should it be regulated differentially? So that would be the argument for going, going to the product. Of course, you can also say then that you have to, if, if food becomes a drug and you have to, everything that's produced then has to be regulated this way, of course it affects everything, it becomes impossible to develop a new line. Yeah.